So let us uh, switch to another uh, rare disease uh, uh, category which is Duchenne muscular dystrophy and uh, as you all know Duchenne muscular dystrophy is the most common fatal genetic disorder which is diagnosed in childhood. It affects approximately one in every 3500 live male births which would mean about 20,000 new cases each year. Because Duchenne gene is found on the X chromosome, it primarily affects boys. However, it occurs across all races and culture. Duchenne can be passed from the parent to the child, but approximately a third of these cases occur because of random spontaneous mutations in the gene. Duchenne results in progressive loss of strength and is caused by a mutation in the gene that encodes for dystrophin. Because dystrophin is absent in Duchenne, muscle cells are easily damaged and muscle structure and function is compromised. The progressive muscle weakness leads to serious medical problems, particularly issues relating to the heart and lung, including cardiomyopathy. Young men with Duchenne typically live into their late 20s. There is a similar but less severe condition called Becker's muscular dystrophy, where the mutation is still in the dystrophin, the same gene but the functional dystrophin is present in the patients in a truncated form compared to uh, in Duchenne muscular dystrophy where there is much more severe defect. So although there are medical treatments that may help slow its progression, there is currently no established therapy or cure for Duchenne. There are two experimental agents, Disapersin and Atiplersin uh, that are undergoing clinical trials. These are both oligonucleotides that alter the splicing of dystrophin RNA transcript and they eliminate the mutant containing exon 51, so called by a process of exon skipping, so that the mature dystrophin can be made from the RNA, partially at least restoring the production of functional dystrophin in the patient. So there are exciting developments which are going on in the area of Duchenne muscular dystrophy. I like to ask Patricia. Uh, about uh, what uh, early signs and symptoms you see in patients with Duchenne muscular dystrophy which can point to the diagnosis of this uh, particular rare disease. Thank you. I'm happy to describe Duchenne. So Duchenne is a heartbreaking disease that occurs over a lifetime of about 29 years, as you said. It begins with a, a little boy um, at birth, and you could really, if you were very um, astute at knowing what you're looking at in terms of having family history, you would notice that this child has head lag. So when you pull him up by both arms, he wouldn't naturally cur curl his head. So you would notice that at first. You also would know delayed mi motor milestones. So this child would be going on the trajectory of following milestones, but just a little bit delayed from his healthy peers. He would, you would notice a waddling gait, and that's sort of a, a, a strange little gait where he exchanges the, the um, weight between both sides of his body in this sort of an abnormal fashion. He can't jump. He doesn't run. He struggles on stairs. So these are very early signs that often are dismissed at, at, by parents. Later on, as the disease progresses, he loses the uh, ability to walk, loses the ability to move his arms. The diaphragm is involved, so respiratory help is needed, and often they die of heart failure. So uh, <clears throat> are there other uh, signs and symptoms uh, which uh, occur in patients with Duchenne? besides the muscular weakness and the heart and the lung condition that you uh, pointed out? Well, Duchenne is a, is a multi-system disease. So when we look at Duchenne, we know that about 30% of the boys have cognitive problems, and that is they can't process very well. These are, these are not progressive signs, and, and so they don't get worse. On the other hand, they are difficult to deal with and need to be thought about in their educational process. It affects the diaphragm, as you mentioned, and can limit and, and really restrict breathing. It also affects the smooth muscles. So these boys have often bladder frequency and urgency, problems with digestion and elimination. And finally, because they don't have normal motor function, their bone density is usually um, much below normal, negative one or two standard deviations. So they are at risk for fractures. Dr. Winter, you want to add uh, to what well, Patricia I think said? Clinically looking at them too, um, the doctor may get fooled at when they look at their calves because they look like they have a large muscle there that would make the doctor 
say, gee, well, this isn't a muscular dystrophy, and that is actually a very characteristic finding. Uh, so if you're, th you know, and I think one thing is it is a devastating diagnosis to sell someone. I've done it many times. And um, a lot of doctors, in my experience, have kind of shied away from making the diagnosis because of the, the fear that, uh, of telling the family they're worried about this. It's one of the more common uh, disorders that gets referred to my clinic where the family has no idea why they've been sent to genetics. And one thing I think you need to know as a primary care is you really do need to tell the people what you're worried about and that you're sending them to the specialists because it's so devastating for the families with this disease to not know why they're even there. Right, you're absolutely right. And the, and the calf muscles are often dismissed in families because you'll have grandma saying, well, they look like football players. So these are pseudo-hypertrophic calves, so the calves get very enlarged. And they're often dismissed by the family because Uncle Joe played football. And so they think that this little boy is going to grow into the muscles. We think some of the boys might have muscle pain. They often refer to the fact that they have tired legs or tired arms. And this word, again, we get into the uncertainty of descriptions, right? Tired, I think, indicates that they're having some discomfort in there and they really can't quite quite describe what that means to them. But the fact that they're tired, tired arms and legs and can't keep up with their peers, and then you see, often see, not always, but often see these muscular calves, those are really signs of Duchenne. So do, yeah. do female carriers, do they also develop some subtle uh, muscular dystrophy? Well, there's a spectrum, so, yeah. I, and I think it, we really haven't studied females, but there are a lot of women who, prior to the diagnosis of their child, will give you a history of having cramps as a young child and not really wanting to be very active, and then that seems to go away. So I, I think that there are, and there certainly are, X-linked inactivation, which means that the good X, for instance, turned off, and we have women with Duchenne, although it's rare. So what specific tests are available for diagnosis of Duchenne, Vanessa? Well, advances in uh, diagnostic technologies really continue to accelerate for Duchenne. And it's among the few of rare conditions where we can both find the underlying genetic cause pretty reliably and understand the meaning of the genetic cause reliably. That's not always the case, unfortunately, with rare disease. So within Duchenne specifically, uh, we often start out by looking up for the most common underlying genetic changes, deletions and duplications. Uh, those are large deletions and duplications within the gene that may take up one or more exons. If we don't see that mutation, we can look at a point, excuse me, if we don't see a deletion or duplication, we can look for a point mutation using sequencing technologies. Both of those, deletion, duplication, and sequencing analysis can also be done on array-based technologies. So we have very many options right now to be able to find that underlying uh, genetic cause. Now, if we do deletion, duplication testing, and sequencing and don't find a mutation, the point there might be to then look at the diagnosis again. Uh, see if there might be another form of muscular dystrophy. There are muscular dystrophy sure. screening panels that can be used. Of course, we want to make sure things like the CK has been done. Uh, and finally, if we still don't find one and the child continues to have the clinical diagnosis of muscular dystrophy of Duchenne or Becker muscular dystrophy, there might be a reason then to consider muscle biopsy. But that is far less done than, than it has been in the past. One thing I think yeah. that we forgot to mention and that you as the primary care doctors should do and often don't is get a pedigree. Mm -hmm. um, this is an excellent condition and very often, especially my Hispanic patients, will have had a uncle, mom's brother, who died maybe at age 18 and no one knows why. And try to find out who died. And when you ask people, what you know does anybody have a similar disease very often I find that people don't talk about those people that died they don't know that you want to describe everybody in the family so you have to ask did people die and the other thing is that you uh, need to know is that once you you say so what can I do I find a mutation it's a four thousand dollar test and what good's it going to do well the targeted mutation, once you find the mutation in a family, you can do very inexpensive yep. targeted mutation studies for all the women at risk of carrying it. And um, so the initial expense may be high, but after that we can offer some very inexpensive testing to try to answer the question for all the handsome 
in this pedigree or wondering so that comes I to genetic counseling then you know right. so what mm -hmm. how how do we do genetic counseling for this particular disease absolutely so f the first step of course is making the diagnosis uh, and to that end making the diagnosis is also key for upcoming therapies as you mentioned and as Pat had mentioned earlier we're seeing a number of therapies coming up that are targeted towards specific mutations so we need to know that information for appropriate treatment of the patient but then once we have that information we can then offer testing to the mother to sisters, to uh, extended family members who might be in that pedigree after we've done the pedigree, to be able to determine what's their risk personally uh, and then what's the, the risk for a future child to be affected as well. And the one thing I will share is that really the technology has continued to advance such that we're looking towards deletion, duplication, and screening tests that will soon drop with a price below $50. Mm -hmm. yeah. Soon we will get there. So that first diagnostic test, which may be a few thousand, is going to decrease in price. And in the future, um, the, for this family's prenatal diagnosis is available. and. Um, the family could choose to use it just as a tool to find out and prepare or with new technologies coming up with new treatments we may be able to treat these babies before they're born or at birth and really change the outcome. And we, we certainly are advancing the idea of newborn screening and we have had two pilot yes. studies on newborn screening to examine that possibility. And I think in parallel to the really exciting therapies that are underway and, uh, and being developed, we want to be prepared for, with newborn screening so we can intervene very early. And, and that so will be utilizing CK, right? Yes, we will.